So the world of the future will be very different. So we, we're going to be all genetically modified and um, our life will, will consist of series of life extension decisions. So every five to 10 years, you will need to decide whether you are going to you know, stick around on earth for another five to 10 years. And given the like, availability of different technologies on sciences, uh, science, um, which will be there, like we all go and be f full of sensors. Uh, like I'm full of sensors today. So uh, it's uh, Apple Watch, uh, glucose monitor, zero patch. I don't have it now. I, I do it like seven days every year. Zero patch, which measure my electrocardiogram, put it on chip uh, as well. I use Oura Ring to measure my sleep. I'm just experimenting. It's charging at the moment with Whoop, the wearable from Amazon. Yeah. Um, and uh, so, but like all of us going to be full of sensors, similar to our cars today mm -hmm. and our cars in the future. And we're all going to be interconnected in one network. I'll call it Internet of Bodies, similar mm -hmm. to the concept of Internet of things that we already heard. Welcome back to another edition of Mentory TV. Thank you very much for joining us. Today, we're going to look at, well, something that perhaps everybody dreams about, living a fantastic, satisfactory, long and healthy life. How do you do it? And this is why I invite today Sergey Young. Sergey Young is a longevity expert, longevity investor, and his mission is actually to expand the healthy life uh, span for at least a billion people on this planet. He's also the founder of the Longevity Vision Fund, a fund that puts the money where his mouth is, where his knowledge is, about 100, billion, 100 million Million per potentially 100 million US dollars worth. Not yet. <laughs> Where Sergey is really trying to support technologies, especially to support our lifespan going forward. And he also started something that I'm really enamored by. It's a non profit corporate longevity program called Longevity at Work, which I think is awesome. He uh, also supports the Age Reversal X Prize. Remember, Ray Kurzweil and also Peter Diamantis uh, launched the X Prize to just find the right solution in order to solve the world's problems. And that is specifically on aging that um, uh, Sergey supports. And he authored already quite a few books. But today we're going to talk about your newest book, The Science and Technology of Growing Young. Mentioning your own name there, Sergey. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Patricia. Hi, everyone. I'm so excited to be here with you today. And well, thanks for the introduction. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Great. Thank you very much for joining us here today from Moscow. Listen, um, you know, the question of longevity and the fountain of youth, Sergey, it's been something that's been with us since the human exists. Yeah. Tell me, what do you think is actually the obsession with trying to, you know, be as young as possible for as long as possible? Um, well, th that's a very interesting question. And obviously, I can offer my thoughts on that, but uh, yeah, I don't know the answer. So my thoughts are, well, it's number of fears which drives us. I, I, you know, I'm like super positive guy like you and, and uh, you know, majority of our audience, but um I think it's about fear of death. I think it's about fear of missing out. And, uh, and we are really hungry species, not in terms of food, but in terms of experience, travel, things that we want to do in life, number of kids that we want to have. And uh, so my dream is, I always had a dream to go to the moon or to Mars. And I, I know it sounds crazy and uh, you'll never find the dividing line between being crazy and aspirational and creative and, and practicality. So it's somewhere in between. It's half serious, half just dreaming. Um, but then imagine if you live in 75 years, and this is the average lifespan in the US, for example, where I do a lot of business, um, then can I excuse myself for my four kids and wife? For like, guys, I'm going to be back in three years. So no one will allow me to do so. So then I invented this whole, you know, life extension thing. So if I can live to 200 years, um, then I can basically, you know, use whatever Elon Musk will create in terms of the um, 
uh, you know, our ability to travel to the other planet, and then I'll have spare, you know, a couple of years to excuse myself from from the Earth. So that's that's like a crazy way to uh, think about this. But um, it, it, well, the other comment is. Um, the life extension and increase of our lifespan is happening already. And it's here whether we want it or not. In the last hundred years, we've managed to, to increase the average lifespan on Earth uh, by a factor of two. So like hundred years ago, it was 35 to 40 years uh, average lifespan. Right now, it's uh, anywhere between 75 uh, to 80 years, depending on the country you look at. So we just double down on lifespan anyway. Well, the interesting fact, we've never been able to cross um, the sound barrier, the maximum lifespan. It was always been 120 years. So like in the history of humanity, you always you know, seen people who live beyond 100 years. The oldest person of, on earth, she was French. She died 20 years ago. Uh, at the age of 122 and a half years. So this is like a sound barrier. We, we've never been able to, um, to cross and to break. And um, all we've done so far, we've been just fighting with diseases and avoiding early death. So that's why statistically, the average lifespan was always increasing and it's, it will continue to increase. So whether we want it or not, we all gonna be living longer or substantially longer that we currently uh, think or expect. So for me, the book was uh, the real opportunity, one, to tell people uh, and share the, the, all these longevity science and technology uh, stories, because we're looking at 200 longevity technology companies a year to invest in 10 of them. So that's on one side. On the other side, just to help them to sort out the questions and, and change the mentality in terms of taking back responsibility for their own health or for their own lifespan and health span. And uh, think about their like personal health strategy, personal financial strategy, and uh, personal social realization strategy yeah. as well. Well, I think you touched already on so many points that you are going through chapter, uh, in, individual chapters uh, in your book. And let's start with, you know, the basic concept. And I thought the way you constructed the book was so smart looking at those three horizons. Okay, yeah. the horizon to live to 100. What is your personal target, by the way? Yeah, so... What is, what is your mean, personal target? <laughs> How long so do you want to live? My personal target is living to 200 years. Uh, but then obviously we need to go through all three horizons to extend it. Like, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Mine is 111. So I'm a bit less ambitious, but the 111 is the number. Yeah, 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 of yeah, angels, so. Yeah. <laughs> so I thought 111 is a good one. So the first horizon is 100. The second horizon is 150 years. And the third one is 200 and beyond. So yeah. I'm kind of keeping between the uh, you know first and second horizon. <laughs> and what I thought was interesting and very smart, the way you did is, hey, guys, we are already there. We can live easily, even yeah. we are more or less the same generation. Yeah. And our kids for sure can live to 100, if not 120, that yeah. upper barrier. Yeah. What can we do already right now to ensure that we don't only have those 100 years, yeah. but also good years, especially yeah. towards the end of those years? Yeah, that, well, that's a great question. That's actually the question why I'm, I'm here in, in longevity field. Like, you know, I dream, I love all of these technologies which are going to be available to us in 10, 20, 50 years. But like, there's so many things that we can do today to extend our health span and lifespan. And like, unless you really genetically unlucky, it, so you, you, uh, you took a wrong ticket in genetic lottery, which is very rare. Um, um, there's so many things we can do to live to 100 healthy and happy years. Um, so that's actually the like a bonus chapter in the end of my book. And it's uh, and it's twice as long as any other chapter. I wonder why did you make that the bonus chapter? Because uh, I mean, uh, maybe because of the two other books. Yeah, like we have, have a very that. different audience, right? Like probably you have on your TV as well. Some of the people like know this already. And some of the people just right in the beginning of this wonderful discovery path of uh, uh, to their healthy and uh, and um, happy years. So, and also I wanted to to make this chapter like really big. So I think it's thirty five to forty pages. And um, 
And that's why uh, there's so many exciting stuff. So um, it, it, in terms of practicalities, I, I, I always talk about five longevity buckets that we need to address today. And for some of the people, it might sound boring, but the, the price of your discipline and, and you managing all this complexity of these five buckets is, it, is at least plus 10. But if you ask me, it's it's at least plus 20 healthy and happy, uh, happy years to your life. So then, well, let's start with number one. When I have 30 seconds to talk about longevity, I always talk about um, annual health checkup. And um, uh, so if you ask me, you know, the date of my checkup is the most important date of uh, my life every year. So my wife, you know, obviously has a, some some different expectations. What is the most important date? But for me, <laughs> this year it was June eighth when I went to San Diego, California, to Human Longevity Center, and I I, I spent like a day there uh, to check my health. And um, almost everywhere in Europe um, and in US, you you can always find the clinic to do a checkup. It's actually a pretty standard procedure. You just need to have a dialogue with your doctor saying you want to. T- take a look at the risk of cancer, heart disease, diabetes, and neurodegenerative diseases. So this is like, th- these four diseases take away nine out of 10 people after the age of 50. The Statist- four horsemen, right? The four yeah. horsemen that kill you. Mm-hmm. So that's uh, that's a very important thing. And and today we, we have a revolution in these technologies which help us with, with, with very early diagnostic of these diseases. Like 20, 40 years ago, cancer was kiss of death. Not today. I mean, if, you, if you've done really early diagnostic of cancer, your recovery chances is from 90 to 100% for some of the cancer types. So that's very important. Then, and more, what is more important, it's cheaper because uh, if you're treating the disease proactively, your chances to recover higher, the quality of your life is going to be sustained and it's 10 to 20 times cheaper, at least if I compare this to US market. Uh, so then the second piece is, uh, I call it don't die stupid or passive longevity. Um, so uh, like tobacco smoking, yeah. I know this is not fashionable anymore. And this is great, but I, I still can see people like, I'm, I'm going to Italy, as you know. Yeah. To <laughs> Tuscany. And you know, I, I still can see people smoking there. Smoking, mm-hmm. tobacco smoking is like minus 10 years from your life, statistically. Not using the seat belts. Uh, is minus uh, uh, two years from your life. Some of the countries allow you to drink glass or two of wine and still y- you'll be el- eligible for driving. This is really bad. This is another minus two, minus three years from your life. And like, and, and when we all have driverless cars, uh, use them because driverless cars will, will drop mortality rates for car accidents by a factor of 10. So this is the all smart choices or, I mean, if you do like a risky sport, specifically like mountain climbing, you need to think. uh, Skydiving, bungee jumping. Yeah, yeah, all of those things. Yeah, I have a friend in California. She's an amazing woman and great entrepreneur, but she's a big fan of mountain climbing. So I just received a note from her last week saying, Sergey, I'm about to climb uh, the mountain in Pakistan called K2. And this is the most dangerous mountain on earth. 25% mortality rate. So I was born uh, on, and, and I was um, growing on the books of Dostoevsky, Tolstoy, uh, Pushkin, and then Russian roulette um, is, if you're doing like Russian roulette, is, um, is 17%, 17% chances to die. Like, but like going to K2 is 25% chances to die. And I, and I know a lot of you know, people who just like riding motorcycles, like motorcycles mortality rate is 17, not percent times higher than mortality rates from car accidents. Okay, so then enough, you know, otherwise I'll sound like your grandma. No, 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 it's good. It's good. Always. I mean, the thing is, you know, people listening to our conversation right now get like, okay, you can't take drugs. You shouldn't drink. Uh, you shouldn't <laughs> do, you know, stuff like that. I mean, what's the fun in living? And then if I look at, you should eat less. You should yeah. trust more. You yeah. need to make smart yeah. choices. No SOS, yeah. sugar, yeah. oils, and salt. You know, all of this, of course, Bill, the 10 good habits of really trying to live a good life, not now, <laughs> but whatever we do now, Sergey, right? Yeah. At the end of the day, writes our future and writes our past. So yeah. at the end of the day, longevity actually starts for 
the first horizon with our birth and the way already perhaps our mother, what sort of hormones she had, how happy she was during our pregnancy, and then what kind of food she raised us on and what the general atmosphere was. So all of this, it's like a pension fund, basically, that we need to accumulate. And I think <laughs> this is, a, a, you know, as, an, as an, a psychological, physiological pension fund into the chronological side of things. This is how I interpret it. And I, uh, you know, I, I, I like it. And I have to say, you know, I meditate as well. I do intermittent fasting. I don't do it like hardcore like you do. Yeah. seems to be like you're doing once a week. I don't know. Yeah, 36 yeah, I do 36 hours. hours once a week. Yeah, just like, if, if we're still talking about today, like number three is the diet and fasting. So vegetables based, high quality of meat and fish, yeah. fasting. Uh, number four is physical activity. And uh, I'm like, I'm using my Apple Watch to measure my 10,000 steps a day. And then on top of it, you can do stretching, heavy lifting, cardio, whatever you like. Yes. And number, number five is actually what you just talked about is, yeah, I call it peace of mind. Like if you don't have, if you are not enjoying your years, it doesn't make sense to, to extend it. Okay, yeah. so that's that's clear. But how you do it? I mean, first of all, you need to be in resourceful state. So sleep is extremely important. And like, um, I remember I met a guy, oh, uh, this is amazing book. Isn't after, it fabulous? Yeah, it is. I want so, him on the show. I want him on the reading, show. After reading uh, Matthew Walker, um, I completely changed my uh, attitude to sleep. Right now, my rule is eight hours in the bed, seven hours of sleep. So that's, that's super important. And um, I remember I've interviewed 50 different people, like experts on all the fields for the book. And uh, including like guys like George Church, the man who sequenced human genome, David Singler, the uh, Harvard Medical School professor, author of Lifespan book. Um, Aubrey uh, de Grey. Peter, Peter, spoke yeah, Aubrey de Grey. Peter, Peter Jackson, the man uh, who created the Avatar movie with James Cameron, yeah. Hobbit movie, Lord of the Rings. Amazing. We talk about human avatars. Actually, the, the man who invented human avatars in Japan, Professor Tachi, I, I had an interview with him. So I wanted to interview Matthew Walker. And I, so I sent him a note like, Matthew, I'm, you know, I'm the man. We have a mutual friends like Ray Kurzweil, Peter Diamantes. Uh, can I interview that? And like the auto response came immediately saying, um uh well dear, i'm asleep i'm asleep yeah, 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 dear, I'm, asleep. So, uh, I, I'm on my creative uh, and book writing vacation oh. in 2019 uh and and in year 2020 please send me a note early 2021 uh if you want to catch my attention i'm like oh my god like <laughs> Two years. It was back in 2019, pre-COVID. Uh, so it was a lot of fun. But And I remember I met a guy who's he's a founder of uh, Human Performance Optimization Clinic in London. His name is Dr. Jack Cradle. And I'm still quoting him. So we had a lunch in London back in 2019. And I'm like, yeah, Jack, what is your number one advice? You, you tell me. Uh, and he's like, Sergey, every evening we can visit... Uh, the most efficient and the best clinic in the world with sleep. And I'm like, oh my God, such a wonderful way of you know putting this. So then the second piece from this piece of mind is obviously mindfulness and meditation. Our body were never uh, was never created to handle all the stress that we have around us. So that's why decreasing our cortisol level through that is, is very important. And um, Number three within this, you know, bucket number five, which is peace um, of mind, is mm -hmm. um, is what I call think and grow young. Uh, just having your sense of purpose, uh, your dreams, uh, giving to the world more than you take. Uh, this this whole concept of social realization and uh, helping other people is is is. is uh, it's really cool. So th th this is what helps you to enjoy your years. Absolutely. It's absolutely fundamental. And what you were just saying, the, the peace of mind through meditation, just getting rid of the negative hormones that we do yeah. accumulate. And, you know, I'm such a tech freak. I love technology. And I love uh, also in your book, especially now we're starting to talk about the second and the third horizon, what technology can really enable 
is incredible. And I am an investor in it and I continue to believe in it. On the other side, I'm very, very spiritual and I do do meditation and I do have to do it maybe more because the technology I have around me stresses me out. And as you were saying, you know, biologically, we are not built for this velocity of innovation, information, and you're like vertical knowledge we have to have, but on such a broad spectrum yeah. that it's really, really hard to manage and give the brain, literally neurologically, the time to have that information settle because that is how you learn. So these moments of withdrawing and giving, giving that, that mystical moment to the brain to actually kind of like fathom what's going on, yep. making sense, yep. and then yep. spitting yep. something out that is called productivity or, or creativity is yep. something we have to fight for these days. And, you know, and also the, the happiness. You know, I don't know if you know Sadhguru, Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's fantastic. Okay. Now he actually has in, in his yoga teaching, he's got um, yoga teaching. He's got one fundamental thought, which is, hey, you decide how you interpret the world around you. And that liberty of saying my life can be a tragedy or a triumph. I think yeah. sets me free in every moment where I go like, oh my God, I'm going to have Sergey Brin <laughs> on the show. <laughs> I'm going to have Sergey Young on the show. I'm going to have all the Sergeys on the show that ever made him big. Okay. <laughs> so do you know what I mean? So uh, it is, but it's super important. Let's move on because you have yeah. a heart out and there's so much I would like to cover now in terms of mm -hmm. the horizons and the technology. Yeah. Horizon number two, okay, 150. And yeah, okay. there you're also already invested with a longevity fund in some of these yeah. technologies. Tell us about um, stem cell um, discovery, 3D yeah. bioprinting, yeah. of course, gene editing, epi yeah. epigenetics. Tell yeah. us yeah. how that really so adds to our in this field. Yes. Uh, so then um, for our audience, the second horizon, that you, I call it the near horizon of longevity. These are technologies which are going to be available to us in 10 20 years obviously you need to do a lot of stuff like we just explained to stay on longevity bridge but in 10 20 years uh time the world going to be completely different so when people ask me and this is where we invest through longevity vision fund we already invested in 16 companies and we're going to invest more um so when people ask me like what is what are the most promising technologies uh which are there I always mention three. So one is gene editing and gene therapy. 30 years ago, it took humanity 13 years and, and $3 billion to sequence human genome. Right now, you can do it in, in a few hours and it costs $200. You even have like a kid's kit to sequence genome of bacteria, not- 23 and me, for example. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, no, but you can, like for kids, they can play it and, and do like genetic modification ah. of with bacteria and it's cost $170 in US. So this is how far we the went. they love the spitting, right? They love the spitting. Yeah. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and uh, we already, we like gene therapy or gene editing uh, 20 years ago was available to only to hand, literally handful of people who had nothing to lose on earth. So th that's why they were ready for this experiment uh, using CRISPR technology to amend their DNA. Today, we are all participating in a huge, hopefully positive, I do think it's positive experiment in gene therapy. Moderna, AstraZeneca, uh, you know, is gen genetic therapy vaccines. So that's amazing. We've been able to save millions of lives and probably even more uh, uh, from COVID because of gene therapy and more to come in 10 to 20 years. Uh, so that's that's very important. We already know all 3000 genes in our DNA, which are responsible for aging processes. And therefore, if we can influence them and we can, and we will be, uh, then you can basically uh, delay the moment where all these age-related diseases like cancer, heart disease, neurogenerative diseases, diabetes will start to catch you. So that's that's a fundamental. And that's why I'm very hopeful that we will break this sound barrier of 122 years because this is, this is the capability we've never had in the yes. whole history of humanity. Yes. So that's, that's very important. That's really important. Let me quickly interject there. I also had one of your friends, Chris Verber, Dr. Chris Verber, oh, yeah. on the show as well. And yeah, Amazing he's, guy. He's Fabulous guy, fabulous guy. And of course, we went into the gene editing. And what fascinates me also as a mother, if you can um, kind of guarantee more or less on demand the health of your baby, that you kind of 
you know, screen it genetically and, and have a look at where are potential mutations that then bring the cancer, that bring the, maybe the, the, the plaque amyloids or whatever, whatever in, you know, in the life and that you can interfere, intervene, cut it out and really give birth to a healthy baby on the long run. And that I think is, is amazing. Amazing. So then it's a question whether it's going to be from 20 years from now and from 50, but I'm pretty sure we're going to define our perfect health at the moment of birth. I mean, not for you and me, but for our kids, grandkids, grand grandkids, it doesn't matter. It's going to happen on earth. We're going to redefine humans. So the second piece of it is regenerative medicine. And, and this is where stem cells are uh, there. But I'm actually more hopeful about our ability to replace organs inside our body. Because think about the old car. And uh, uh, I have a lot of a lot of friends in Switzerland who are big fans of old cars, so they buy it. And then you you can extend the resource of the old car. How you do that? You replace the engine, you replace these particular spare parts, etc. So the same thing will happen with human body and mind. So um, how are we going to do that? This 3D bioprinting of organs uh, now is developing. Unfortunately, today like 90% of what is 3D printed is done for the labs. So it's just done for the trials, not to torture humans or uh, animals, but to do it with 3D printed organs. Um, beautiful, amazing woman and entrepreneur Martin Rothblatt do um, use different animals to regrow organs and then we can use for ourselves. Uh, like pigs, they're more genetically close to us than any other alternative. Uh, in a company called United Therapeutics, it's a multi-billion dollars company. Uh, or the company that we invested in called like Genesis, they use our lymph nodes to regrow organs. So like one donor liver can help 50, 75 patients. And in the course of three to six months uh, from this kind of donor liver nucleus, they develop like a liver B inside your body and it takes up the functionality of your uh, liver, which is not working at the moment. Uh, so this is great. I, I, I think it's very promising and... Uh, if, if we take care of the car through sensors and, and maintenance and replacements of the spare parts, it, it, we should apply the same approach to our human body. So that's two out of three. And third, in 10 years time, we're going to have a new class of drugs and it's going to be called longevity drugs or age-related diseases drugs. Uh, so today, all the drugs that we have, that goes against one particular disease mm -hmm. while we all know, you know, after you turn 40, 50, like 55, your chances to get age-related diseases like cancer, heart disease, diabetes, neurogenerative disease increase exponentially. Yeah. So that's why we need to look at the fund fundamentally where it coming from, like what is happening with our genetic footprint and what starts our aging process and therefore making you prone to... Um, to all of these diseases. So, and we already have some few, you know, few candidates like metformin, the old diabetes drug, it's generic drug, um, or rapamycin, immunosuppressant drug. Uh, I'm not suggesting to take them now. We still need to do like a human trial yeah. uh, with them. But like in five to seven years, we're going to sort this out. Or it's going to be drug developed by artificial intelligence because AI today uh, can compress the uh, drug development and discovery cycle significantly. So it might be an opportunity to develop this. So these three things for me is the most promising from the near horizon. They're gonna be available to us in 10, 15 years from now, stay on longevity breach and then enjoy your extended life yeah. again. Yeah, no, absolutely. And then really point towards 150. And uh, one of the chapters that really caught my eye was about precision medicine, because I'm already thinking we are already halfway there when people are looking re really at you and looking at you holistically. And it's, you know, the functional approach to medicine rather than the classical approach to medicine, where you just look at a part of whatever, you know, you have the same and I have the same. However, we are not the same, even though we have, you know, both hands. However, yeah. my hand is just different and needs a different approach. And this precision medicine is also very much helped by technology now and the technology part of course comes in big especially when it comes to ai uh, or aei um, as well as uh, you know uh, quantum quantum computing when it comes to 200 and plus and take us through a little bit what the quantum leap indeed can be um, and i have to say just before you start saying it, yesterday i was out for business dinner with some some of my my partners and I said, oh, 
tomorrow I've got Sergey Young on the show <laughs> to talk about extreme longevity. And I was like, you know, I'm such a nerd with these things. And everyone goes, oh, Patricia is off on her right again, <laughs> talking about all this health stuff and not blah, 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 whatever. So I said, so how do you think about, you know, if you could always exchange your liver or your kidney? And they were like, wow, that's good. I like that. I don't want to really grow up, but what I do like is drinking without any consequences. Just, just to <laughs> say, you know, that people pick and choose, but they go like, why would I want to live until I'm 200 or plus? Mm. I mean, uh, you know, what's the purpose in my life? And, and once you talk us through the technology that really could catapult us to that, and, you know, over the gray is really, I think the one of the most extreme that talks about we are immortal. And then we talk a little bit about the morality of the entire yeah. issue and what extreme longevity or even Im immortality would mean for our modus operandi, for yeah. our, you know, a human species as such, and, and the convergence, maybe the singular singularity there as well. Yeah, very important. So, well, let's start first with uh, Far Horizon of Longevity. So, how the world will look like in 25, 50 years from now. And I, I, I have to say there's so many things we need to solve before that. So, we'll talk about morality of immortality as a second piece. But uh, I'm, I'm actually waiting for this with combination of uh, excitement and fear as well. So, it's not like I'm, I'm saying we're all going to be immortal. We'll just become you know, human avatars, and that's it. So the world of the future will be very different. So we're going to be all genetically modified, and um, our life will will consist of series of life extension decisions. So every five to 10 years, you will need to decide whether you are going to you know, stick around on Earth for another five to 10 years. And given the like, availability of different technologies on sciences, uh, science, um, which will be there, like, we all go and be full of sensors. Uh, like I'm full of sensors today. So uh, it's uh, Apple Watch, uh, glucose monitor, zero patch. I don't have it now. I, I do it like seven days every year. Zero patch, which measure my electrocardiogram, put it on chip uh, as well. I use Oura Ring to measure my sleep. I'm just experimenting. It's charging at the moment with Whoop, the wearable from Amazon. Yeah. Um, and uh, so, but like all of us going to be full of sensors, similar to our cars today mm -hmm. and our cars in the future. And we're all going to be interconnected in one network. I'll call it internet of bodies, similar mm -hmm. to the concept of internet of things that we already heard. Okay. Then what else? Um, we humans, we very binary. So it's either like one or zero, it's black or white. And, and this is our modus operandi, right? This is, this is the way we see life. But um, uh, artificial intelligence uh, going to complement human intelligence. So it's not going to going to be either or, or we're not going to be at war, two types of intelligence. Human brain will be connected with computer, with artificial intelligence. And we can save lives and can increase the quality of life of people who are suffering today from d dementia or Alzheimer. I don't know if you've seen the, uh, the recent movie, um, uh, from Anthony Hopkins. Called. Anthony Hopkins, father. Yeah. Was it? Yeah. Is it the father? I, I think. Yeah, the yeah. father. Yeah. I, 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 I wanted to. It would have depressed my husband. He's twenty years older than me. He said, "I don't want to see that." Uh, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. You got to see that. <laughs> it is a very depressing movie, and, and the unfortunate reality: we don't know what we don't know today about neurogenerative diseases. Out of all the four killer monsters that I explained today, neurogenerative diseases like Alzheimer, dem dementia. Is, is the least uh, uh, known area for us because it com they come later in life. They, they, like uh, 20, 40, 60 years ago, there was not a lot of people who actually reached this barrier around 80, 90 years when you face uh, neur neurogenerative uh, decline. But like what is done by Elon Musk today, Neuralink, is beautiful. So we can then uh, it's invasive technology, so I'm afraid of it. But like, if you can complement yourself with artificial intelligence uh, and 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 access to computer power, it's an opportunity for you to live much healthier portion of your life right in the end of it. So that's Absolutely. Absolutely. that's what's gonna happen. Yeah. We're gonna be. We'll have a choice to replicate ourselves in either as a robotic avatar or the human, or sorry, as a virtual avatar. Well, in fact, my resolution for the next year to create a virtual avatar of Sergey Yan because my mission is to change one billion lives. So next time we speak in year time, it's going to be two of us. So I need to train him for like for the first six months. 
uh, his neural network, and then he can speak, you know, he can uh, uh, look at investment opportunities, he can work with the countries to implement national longevity programs or with corporations to implement corporate longevity programs in the offices, in the factories as well. Again, free of charge, right? This is all pro bono for me. Uh, so, but then it, it, we'll have this opportunity. And now like every time when, when some piece of technology shocks you, you, can, you should always say like, do I know people in this world uh, where this technology will not be extreme, but going to be like super helpful? For example, my grandfather, he died 25 years ago and uh, he was amazing. He, he did a lot for me to grow. Uh, to develop myself as a person. So I would still uh, would love to have an opportunity every month for one hour to spend with the virtual avatar of him and ask my basic question, like, what is the purpose of life? What do I do with the four kids when they all go crazy, uh, et cetera? And uh, this is beautiful. And obviously, we're all going to be full of sensors, like nanobots going to be flowing in our blood, fighting cancer exactly. cells exactly. Yeah, and really in, right in the beginning. So this is the, the world of the future. <laughs> so then, so this is the far horizon of longevity. We can live indefinitely. I'm not big, a big fan of immortality, yeah. so, but I, I'm a big fan of living longer if you have a purpose. So yeah. then... It's, it's an important question. And your sec second question is like, what's the ethics of it? Yeah. And it's like, uh, it's a separate chapter in the book uh, called Morality of Immortality when I do address that. And it's more asking questions rather than giving answers. It's, it's, it, all of this are you know, very difficult trade-offs that we need to uh, yeah. go through. If you ask people today in US and UK, two thirds of the people would not want to extend their life. Why is that? I mean, this is counterintuitive for me and for you because we literally are super positive people, which is actually genetically predisposed. But um, um, like what concerns people? Well, the, concern, the, the human concern is we have created the science and technology to extend our life, but we haven't created life that we want to extend. So look at the world today, like inequality is growing all the time. I actually believe longevity should be one of the rare opportunities to unite the nations, unite the world rather than continue to divide it. Um, or um, what is happening with our social um, structures and institutions Values, yes. like marriage? Uh, Two thirds of the marriages go through divorce stage in the first five or seven years after the date of marriage. This is ridiculous. It's unfortunate, it's very outdated uh, social constructs and we need to upgrade it. I'm not against that. I'm happily married man with four kids, but um, shall we define something more mutually responsible like kid raising partnerships and give you know, people the opportunity not to live uh, together for uh, 150 years if you don't want to? Um, then what will happen with my career? Today, like you can have one or two careers, uh, one or two marriages in life, but like in the future, if we live in 150 years, can I have as many careers as possible in my life? Will I have an opportunity, acceptance from the society to contribute in my old age? Or what will happen if I will outlive my finances? You know, all these social structures like marriages, retirement, you know, all of this has been constructed for a completely different world when people were living for like 35 or 45 years. And that's it. And then, or uh, my favorite one, our relationship with Mother Nature. Uh, if, we, if we think we're all going to die at 75, I can drop the plastic in the ocean or in the lake and say, oh, next generation will sort it out. If I'm going to live 150 years, I will face the consequences of my own actions. And this is what is happening with global warming today yeah, and in the plastic in the ocean and in our water. Uh, so uh, can we finally take back control of our health and, uh, and the health of our planet? So th this, there's so many things that we need to solve in the next 25 years before we embrace the idea of longevity. We need to find a sense of purpose and bring the harmony in this world. So that's why ethical aspect is very important. As I said, in 20 years from now, the biggest obstacles for us living longer, not gonna be science, not gonna be technology, it's gonna be ethics and regulation.
Yeah, no, absolutely. And you know, the first naysayers always say, we are too many people on the planet anyway, and then you want to make us old. And there's quite a few studies that we do have like a maximum amount of people that the planet will carry because birth rates are going down. Yeah. But I thought just very quickly picking up on the responsibility, will you be living more responsibly if you know you're going to be around for 150 years or 200? And I wonder whether there might be, you know, a bit of a binary answer to it, where I just thought you might might be living more responsibly towards, hopefully, towards the planet, so your habitat. But when it comes to your own life, considering that you can become bionic or an avatar eventually, then you can say, what do I care? I just do what I want to do uh, because everything that I damage along the way, I may be able to repair to to, because of technology. And I wonder whether there's kind of like a, an interesting, you know, mind game to it. Um, I wouldn't believe necessarily that this is the kind of attitude you should have. But for me, the entire question of purpose and how I live, let's say I live 150 years. And what you were saying, Sergey, I think is the most important thing. Did I contribute something to yeah. this planet, to the world, to the people? Because if I did, maybe whatever my, you know, clone, my avatar will be in terms of sapienza, knowledge, may be downloaded and used for further generations to just get them, you know, further developed. Now, that might sound totally out of this world or very arrogant. No, uh, I, I know the company called, uh, I think it's called Wisdom AI by my very good friend, Donna Griffin in New York. She okay. does exact, exactly exactly that so she's she's been an artificial intelligence to transfer wisdom from generation to generation so this is happening today telling stories uh, of value last question because you have a hard out um the key lessons sergey you as a man have learned on your own journey in life when it comes to self-management life management and what you think this book really should should bring to whoever takes it um, and reads it uh well i think my lessons is uh you can people always ask me like why do i need to live longer and i'm and i'm always saying i, I can answer all of your questions apart from this one this is you need to decide. You cannot really outsource the finding sense of purpose in life to other people. This is your own dialogue, okay? Uh, so what I found, like you know, I, I'm I'm pretty successful man, and I I I I was managing I'm managing multi billion dollars private equity portfolio all around the world, and uh, until I started to share the best of me with the world, until I I started to find the solution into making other people happy, healthy, and successful, my life was not really meaningless. It was only like my kids were like the only meaning. And this is where I uh, I find the joy uh, and sense of purpose. But like once you start to help other people, once you start to give more than you take, your life will, will change. So think about spiritual leaders that you've seen at, like either you're on YouTube or in person. They all shine, they look younger, they live longer, they're happy. Well, that's that's the model, right? I mean, you don't need to go to the church. You have a lot of choice these days. Uh, but uh, it, this is the most important thing, right? And then like the universe will give you substantially more uh, later on. But uh, if you're sharing the best of you, this is, this is, this is where you can, can find a sense of purpose. So that's one. If you think about takeaways from the book, uh, it's really the following. We're all going to be living much longer than we expect. So we need to start thinking process uh, early on today. It's time to take back control and responsibility for our own health and health of the planet world going to be completely different in 10, 20, 30 years time. We're going to redefine ourselves as a human. We're going to live healthier, happier, and longer life. We we'll just make sure you stay on longevity bridge in the next 10, 15 years to enjoy and embrace these uh, technologies. And then finally, you know, think about the world. Don't be selfish. And this is where you can find happiness and sense of purpose. And this is uh, what gives you the answer to the question, why live longer? Excellent. Sergey, 
Fantastic. I really, really enjoyed our conversation. You are awesome. Thank you so much for all the work you do, pro bono, uh, nonprofit. Really, you do make a difference to society. Anybody who stays curious, listens, and really kind of wants to do something with these days. We, we were given by whatever force, uh, you know, through the bodies of, uh, of our mother. The science and technology of growing young. Uh, I enjoyed every single page. I enjoyed also those little quotes uh, you you put in <laughs> and uh, compliments big time. I know it's already selling like hotcakes. So all the best to you. Thank you so much. And to see thanks, you. Patricia. Thanks, everyone. Stay healthy and happy, please. <sighs> And thank you, my dear Mentory TV community, for having joined us yet again for another edition, this time with Sergey Young on his book, The Science and Technology of Growing Young. As you heard, you can do already a lot today, a lot more tomorrow if you want to live 150 years, or even in terms of technology, AI, quantum computing, and everything else around it in a few years' time when it comes to living to 200 or beyond. I hope you enjoyed our conversation. I'll see you next time. Bye. <laughs>